By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back from the Dwarven Warriors Cup, this alpha beta tournament. And we have reached the top eight. And in the top eight, we are going to see Anis, who's playing with a two color deck. He's playing green and he's playing black. And he's going to take on Magnus. And Magnus, yes, the Magnus, the founder, one of the founders of Swedish old school magic. And he's actually playing with a powered black and white deck. So I think this is going to be a really, really tough challenge for Anis here. Let's just quickly look at Anis's list and then I see that he's playing with the giant spider, one of my favorite creatures. I think he's also playing with the giant grove. So that means that he can make a giant giant spider. So I'm really hoping to see that. And he's also playing with black, the other color, and he kind of uses that to neutralize his creatures. And he's got a pretty cool card that doesn't see a lot of play, a card that I personally really like. It's weakness and weakness is one black, it's an enchant creature and it gives another creature minus two, minus one. I just think that you know, you get a lot of value for this card. Yes, it is not removal like a terror, but um, with the terror, you cannot cast it on artifact creatures or black creatures. With weakness, you know, you can place it on any creature. And if you if your opponent has a 4-4 four, four, and all of a sudden that turns into a 2-3, uh, it doesn't sound so powerful anymore. So I think weakness is a little bit underplayed. I think it could see a little bit more play. I, I know why, because there's another card that Anis is playing that's usually chosen over weakness when it comes to kind of, you know, removal and taking care of creature threats. And that is Paralyze. One black, it taps the creature directly and during your upkeep, your opponent has to pay four to untap it. So, you know, again, a really strong card, especially if you play it in combination with land removal. Now, I'm not sure if Anis is playing with sinkholes or ice storms. We'll just have to see. I don't have that here with me, that information. I do know he's also playing with a Drudge Skeleton, a very cool creature, one black and one. And of course it has regeneration for one black. And I think regeneration in this alpha beta format is a very strong ability on a creature. So, I, you know, I just wish it would fly because his opponent, let's take a look at the deck of Magnus. His opponent is playing with a powered deck. So he's got, you know, he's got his Moxon ready. Um, and he also plays with Hypnotic Spectres. And that's why I wish Dredge Skeleton would have flying. Of course, Hypnotic Spectre can be perfectly neutralized by a giant spider. So hopefully we'll get that classic battle going on where there's an Hypnotic Spectre on one side of the table and a giant spider on the other side. Giant Spider is actually not that bad of a card, but it just doesn't see a lot of play in regular old school magic because for one green and three, you can also play an Urnum Jin. But, but okay, we're now looking at the deck of Magnus. So Magnus is playing black and white, a classical combination. So obviously he will have Swords to Plows here. Uh, he also has some strong artifacts in his deck. Besides the Moxon, he also plays with, for example, a JM Day Tome, refilling his hand. I think that's going to be a power card as well in this matchup, especially when both creatures, or I mean, both players are playing very creature heavy. So if they both have a lot of creatures on the board early in the game, maybe the game will stall and then a GM Day Tome can kind of give Magnus the cards he needs to get, you know, to get his removal or to get a stronger creature on the board. He's also playing with, with Sangir Vampires, for example, so he can kind of fish for answers when the game is kind of in a standstill. Okay, so these are kind of the two decks, really quick deck tech. That's what I do in this Dwarven Warriors Cup series. Uh, let's go to game one. Let's go to this battle between green and black versus white and black. Let's go. And here we go, game number one. We've got Anis sitting on the left here with his green and black deck. Look at that, taking a double mulligan. Aye, that's painful. So he's just starting with five. He's also on the play, by the way. There is a basic forest and that's Magnus sitting on the right. And it looks like he just kept seven cards in hand. Look at that power hitting the board. Oh, turn one hypnotic specter. Oh, this is like the worst thing that could have happened for Anis. He's already down on cards. And what can he do? And there is a Paralyze. Okay, at least there's an answer. That means he's safe for at least one turn because Magnus cannot pay the four mana 
to untap the hypnotic specter but what an opening here from magnus starting with that hypnotic specter casting mox sapphire mox jet and swamp let's see what he can do in turn number two and have a look here he's finding a basic planes passing turn so probably going to untap next turn obviously depending on his hand because he could also play for example a Sengir vampire for five there is a disenchant making matters even worse because now he can do both untapping the hypnotic specter and let's see what magnus can find second planes here and attacking of course so the first two damage here for anise but what's more important is he's losing valuable cards here, losing a giant growth. And what he really needs next turn is a uh, is a land or a giant spider. Actually both. Because then he can at least stop the hippie. But we also see a jam day tome on the side of Magnus being cast. There's land number four, attacked by grizzly bears. And will we see there is a regrowth. What is he going to regrowth actually? Another paralyzed. And uh, trying to make it as hard as possible for Magnus uh, to attack. And he also has to choose now. Do I want to draw a card, for example, with Jam Day Tome or play something from my hand? Or do I just want to untap if not Spectre? He's choosing to untap the Hippie here. Possibly doesn't have any, um, any uh, creatures in hand or else he would have made a different decision, I feel. And there's the Giant Spider. Okay, so Anise is kind of getting back into this. I mean, he's still behind because of that GM day tome and the fact that Magnus still has cards in hand. So, but I mean, I, I think it's admirable how well he's done getting back here into this match. And there is a Sengir Vampire. And obviously, Anis cannot block that with the Giant Spider. Well, he can, but then the Giant Spider will just die. So it would just be a chum block. If he can find a Giant Grove, it would be a really nice block. He's just passing turn. Of course, he's still an 18, so he can take a hit. And there's the attack. Beautiful Scrubland there, by the way, from Magnus. Beautiful blackboarded Scrubland. And look at that jewelry on his side of the table as well. Just passing turn. You're probably going to want to activate the book at the end step of Anis here. Getting some extra cards. And oh, I like this a weakness. We talked about weakness in the intro. Unfortunately, the weakness makes it a 2-3. So Giant Spider cannot kill it, but Giant Spider can at least block it. Perhaps an attack with the Grizzly Bear is not too bad here, seeing if Magnus wants to trade the Grizzly for the Hippie. Let's see if he's going to do that. It looks like he's a little bit in the tank. Is he going to attack with both here? Maybe he's just going to play out his hand anyway. No, he's not. He's just passing turn. And there we see that uh, book activation by Magnus. So Magnus now has a 2-3 Sengir Vampire and a 2-2 Hippie with a Paralyze on it. And really nice to see the vivid colors from the Paralyzed, by the way. And there is a Swords to Plowsiers. Oh, that is really bad news. And uh, going to... Well, he gets to life, going to 15, but that's not really uh, what it's all about. Because now he can attack with the Hippie, and he's probably going to lose... Oh, also a Disrupting Scepter here from Magnus. Wow. And we also see that Magnus' nickname is changed here in Magnus Hector the Scepter. Because this is pretty brutal. And taking care doesn't even need his hippie to discard the card. Unfortunately, we can't see it because the graveyard is kind of like out of our sight here. But things are not looking good for Anise playing a Soul Ring. And actually, since turn one, it was not looking great. Okay, now we can see. And there was, oh, that's actually a pretty strong card, Pestilence. Wow, 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 wow. He had to discard Pestilence. Oh, that's bad luck. Of course, he didn't have the Swamp to play the Pestilence yet. I mean, he has one Swamp. He needs two to cast. But, I mean, Pestilence is some light at the end of the tunnel for Anis. But he's lost it because of the Scepter activation. And there is a book. And it's just a lot of riches at the side of Magnus. And uh, it's really not a lot on the side of Anis here. And um, Anis dropping to 12. And Magnus keeping his hippie to block. I still think it's in a way interesting. I think if I would be Anis, I would have just attacked with the Grizzly Bear because a trade for Hypnotic is not that bad. And let's take a look here. So again, Magnus is taking an extra card here from his book. So, I mean, he's really now uh, getting ahead because of the book. 
There's an attack dropping to 10 here and another Hypnotic Spectre for Magnus. I don't really see a way out of here for Anis in this first game. And I wonder what these players are going to board in against each other. Of course, there's a Gloom from the side of Anis if he has it in his sideboard. And there's another activation. I wonder if... But I haven't seen a lot of black creatures yet from the side of Anis, but I wonder if Magnus is playing with a Northern Paladin. That would be really, really sweet. There's a Disenchant here on the weakness. Ay, 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 ay. Things, things just keep looking worse and worse for Anis here. And there is a full attack of eight. Anis dropping to two. And I think this is pretty much end game. Exactly. This is it. This is game number one going to Magnus. But I mean... The game was played in turn one. We have to be honest here uh, with each other. And I think it was admirable how Anis kind of kept being in the race, kind of tried to come back here. Um, you know, at a certain point, he had that giant spider on the board, the weakness on the Sengir. I mean, that all looked pretty good, but Magnus always had more cards and options. And there we see a COP green. Is that really coming in after sideboarding? Anyway, let's uh, give these players some time to sideboard and we'll catch up with them in game number two. Game number two is about to start. And will we see that circle of protection green from Magnus? That would be, I mean, that would be a killer. Because I think Anis, well, maybe he has tranquility. Do I see another mulligan here by Anis? Uh, he's very unlucky here. So he's starting now with six, at least not with five, like in game one. And he has a pretty good opening with the soul ring. And uh, let's hope, oh man, look at that. A beautiful black bordered. Um, uh, <laughs> a Black Lotus. Oh, sorry here, but this is just crazy. And a turn one hippie again. So both games that Anis has played against Magnus, both games there was a turn one hypnotic specter. And this is just brutal. And look at this beautiful answer by Anis. Oh no, there's, oh man. There's a Swords to Plowsiers. Are you kidding me? Oh man. Anis, I feel for you, man. I mean... Don't get me wrong, Magnus, you know, uh, you're a legend, but this is just very, very brutal here. Um, and I don't think we're going to see a real game here in game number two. It's uh, let's let's just see how Anis is going to get killed here in this in this second game. Oh, OK, another giant spider. Maybe I spoke too soon. This is pretty cool. Anis, well done. And uh, another giant spider here. So that means at least the hippie for now is not going to attack. And there is, again, a Jam Day Tome. And I don't think Magnus really minds because he can just sit back and draw extra cards. And Anis was already behind on a card. Let's see what he can do. Or Drudge Skeleton and one mana floating. Okay, using green just to cast a Scrip Sprites 1-1 one, one Flyer. And what I wanted to say is Anis already started with six and, of course, lost a card to the Hypnotic Spectre as well. So he's, he's basically two cards behind and he was on the play. Uh, so you can make that three cards behind. This is actually a pretty nice play, an unholy strength on the Drudge Skeleton. The question is, does he want to attack right now? He's actually going to attack with the Giant Spider. That's kind of interesting. Maybe he's going to play out that other card later in his second main phase, or maybe he doesn't value it that much. He does decide not to attack. And the Drudge Skeleton is a 3-2, and he's not attacking with that because he doesn't have any black mana open to regenerate it. So that's uh, an understandable choice. And here we see, now I get the play here from Anis. He was going to cast his card anyway, so he's not afraid of that Hypnotic Spectre discard ability. But again, look at that book, the Jam Day Tome, doing so much work for Magnus. We saw that in Game 1. We're seeing that here in Game 2. And, uh, you know, it's hard when you're playing black and green to really have efficient artifact removal in alpha beta remember you don't have access to crumble for example which is a really good card you don't have access to scavenger folk and not really sure where that drudge skeleton came from maybe it was uh, outside of the camera angle there in the in the other graveyard and there is a terror on the giant spider but also the attack here it's a three two that means three damage for magnus and um at least Anis is able to deal some damage with that regenerating Drudge Skeleton. And again, I think I would have also attacked with the Grizzly Bears. 
But I guess I'm just someone who wants to see Grizzly Bears attack because in game one, Anis also held the Grizzly Bears back. And there we see another Hypnotic Spectre. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's just crazy. Checking it with the 2-2. Two -two. Now remember, Anissa's hand is empty at the moment. So he's just taking two damage. So that's not too bad. And he can always keep this Crook Sprite to maybe, you know, possibly chump if he has a card that's valuable enough. But now while I'm saying that, I realize he's got two Hippies. So that's not going to work. Playing another Crook Sprite. So that's actually quite nice. If he wants to, he could double block and kill one of the, one of the Hippies. Uh, because probably Magnus is going to go in for 4 damage now. But maybe... Has he found another Sengir Vampire? That would be bad news for Anis. Yes, that's another Sengir Vampire. Ay, 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 ay. That's of course the problem with the book. Is that, you know, Magnus is getting ahead so much on cards that he can just find threats. I mean, Anis is not even doing a bad job he's actually doing a great job and still dealing some damage to magnus but you know that magnus will eventually find a swords or a big creature like a sangir vampire here to hold anisa's creatures at bay here remember drudge skeleton being a 3-2 is not being able to do much he needs a weakness now that would be kind of nice weakness on the sangir vampire i do believe he's blocking he's tapping a black mana yeah wow unholy strength on the grizzly bear that is pretty nice Again, an interesting play here from Anis, I feel, because he's attacking with the Drudge Skeleton. Not sure if I would do that, because then you're giving the Singer the ability to become a 5-5, I think. But he's not doing it. He's actually blocking the Grizzly Bear, maybe afraid of a Giant Grove. Although, no, Giant Grove goes both ways. Okay, he's, he's choosing to take the damage from the Drudge Skeleton and Chum blocking... I guess, or trading, I should say, with the Grizzly Bear. And now it, it's kind of explained why he's willing to do that. Uh, because he's he had another Sengir Vampire in hand. So that, that's pretty brutal. And then he's taking his turn. You're forgetting to untap the Drudge. But yeah, exactly. That's an untapped Drudge. Just finding a basic forest. And I guess he's kind of getting into that mode where he will be forced to start chum blocking with the script Sprites just to stay alive. Next turn, Magnus can attack with eight. He can also draw a card at the end step of Anis. And I, I really think that the GM Day Tome makes a difference. And of course, we saw in both games, I, can, I like this. And he's just attacking with everything. I like that. I mean, I appreciate that, you know. Just turn your creature sideways. Don't think about it. Don't do the maths. Just attack. I like that. I think it's a cool move. But what I wanted to say is in both games... We saw such an explosive start by Magnus. And, and, and even though Anis had a great start in, in game two with the giant spider soaring and then into giant spider turn two, um, you know, it didn't compare with the crazy starts of Magnus. And there Magnus drawing a card, taking a turn. And here we actually see what happens when the Drudge Skeleton regenerates. There's no counter on Sengir Vampire. So that explains the block earlier made by Magnus and also the attack by Anis. So I apologize for that. I thought that you would get a counter regardless of regenerate or not, but I guess that's not the way it works because it doesn't go to the graveyard. That's probably why it doesn't actually die. So here we see an attack for six. And that means he's going to drop to four here. And he's keeping one hippie at bay. If Anis draws into a giant grove, and Magnus makes a mistake in blocking, which I doubt. But then Anis can actually win this one still, which is pretty amazing. If you look at the crazy good draw of Magnus in this game number two. So I have to I have to give kudos here to Anis for creating that situation where he can actually still win. I don't believe he plays with Berserks or else he would have had another win con. Can you imagine Berserking the Drudge Skeleton right now would make it six damage. And he's on seven. There we see an attack here. And let's see what he's going to do. And is there a disenchant? Ah, disenchant on unholy strength. And then we see a block by the hippie. And Anissa is saying, okay, man, you've got this one. And uh, yeah, that actually means that Anish, you've made it to top eight. How cool is that? I know this was your first alpha beta tournament. So well done. And of course, also a big congratulations to Magnus. Magnus, your deck is looking, wow, it is very impressive. It is uh, very spiky, actually. And I think that maybe with this deck, Magnus could actually take 
the victory here at the Dwarven Warriors Cup. Of course, he still has his semifinals to go through and he has a finals to go through. So uh, let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves. But this is one of the best decks that I've seen here at the Dwarven Warriors Cup. Both players are showing their sideboards. And there was that Circle of Protection green. And uh, uh, there's no gloom, it, uh, it looks like. And he's putting back in those beautiful crawl worms. And there we see, ah, of course, we see a mind twist. I'm not a big fan of that card, but uh, it's understandable that you play it, though. But we see it there uh, in Magnus. He did board it out, so that's, uh, I, I think, so that's nice. Anyway, this was uh, the top eight match from the Dwarven Warriors Cup. Magnus, you've, uh, you've won this one by force. And maybe we'll see you back in the semifinals and the finals. The semifinals will be on this channel next week, Tuesday, and the finals of the week after that. So definitely keep an eye on Timmy Talks if you're interested in the Dwarven Warriors Cup. And of course, we have updates on Tuesday, Friday, and on Sunday. Now, if you want to support Timmy Talks, if you want to support the show, you can do so by liking this video, leaving a comment, sharing it on your socials. All that really helps. Please subscribe if you're not a subscriber yet. I really hope to reach that 2,000 um, the 2K uh, membership number, subscriber number, I should actually say. And you can also become a sponsor of the show. You can support Timmy Talks financially as well and actually get a lot of perks in return. There's probably a pop-up uh, appearing right now and that links to the Timmy Talks Patreon page. So if you click on that link, you will visit the Timmy Talks Patreon page. And um, yeah, there you can see how you can sponsor the show and help Timmy Talks doing uh, you know, what I do, what we do here, uh, creating a lot of old school Magic the Gathering content. For now, thank you for watching and talking about the Patreons. Let's take a look at our fantastic, our amazing, our super cool patrons of Timmy Talk. Let's go to the end scroll. Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazee.